Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Trevor White. Trevor, great to have you on. Hi Dan, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Super excited to talk. We're going to talk about something slightly different today, where sports psychology meets leadership and, and management, not in sports, um, but in well, in the health sector, I think would be the accurate way to put it. But before we dive into that, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody listening in? So my name is Trevor White. I'm a respiratory therapist and uh, clinical leader in uh, Surrey, British Columbia, Canada. You reached out to me. When was it, Trevor? It was probably the end of last year, I think. Um, I think you were listening to the show and you let me know that you'd been using sports psychology techniques to help you uh, lead uh, a project that was COVID-based. Just dig a little bit deeper uh, for us into your your role and when you were leading, when you were leading a project during COVID, uh, what your specific role was. So I started as a um, department head for a small community hospital, um, but my background is in in bigger sized hospitals in in critical care. And I ended up as a operations manager uh, for a testing program and then later a vaccine program. Okay. Uh, And so unpack, unpack that for us. What were you facing as COVID hit? What kind of challenges were you facing? I mean, when we, we first saw COVID um, start to peak up in, in the dialogue ac- across the world, um, there was a, a lot of fear and mm. people were very uncertain. And I just happened to be lucky enough that I, I had a career that kind of brought me into these spaces to prepare me. Uh, when I was a student, um, SARS was, was a big thing. Um, when I was a younger single person, Ebola was around and I ended up getting some high level PPE training through that. Then I encountered H1N1. So I, I'd been around the gambit for various kind of evolving pathogens and, and kind of got to understand the dynamics of, of how people uh, among healthcare and patients were going to kind of respond to those events. And so what unfolded for you in January, February 2020, my, my understanding is that you were faced with having to lead a team of people to distribute vaccines. Um, to talk to us about that that time. What, what were the specific challenges you were facing? What were you doing as a leader? So I was I was um, I was already on to uh, your stuff at, 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 at that point. Um, and. What I realized in these emergent states of where people were kind of stripped raw mm-hmm. and that sports psychology really well applied. And I almost, in my own mind, removed sports from it and started using it as performative psychology mm-hmm. um, be- because it was such a prevalent factor in every single thing that we were trying to do. Um, I just started applying these these tactics, and as as some of your tweets and some of your stuff on your shows came out, uh, it basically guided me in a place to look further and dive deeper into these tools that would allow me to help my team be successful and get where they needed to go. What were you actually doing? What were you setting up? Which was the project? Yeah, so the, the the project started off as a empty box of a warehouse, and uh, I went into that empty box of a warehouse in, in October 30th of 2020, and we were testing, uh, setting up testing with, within about uh, 10 days from there. And what that entailed is basically empty room, and we had to order everything. We had to grab everything. Uh, every single piece of equipment we needed to make this go. And there was a team to help us with that. Um, But I basically had to orientate and integrate uh, about 30 team members um, who I'd never met before, who some were healthcare, others were in more kind of clerk roles. 
and I had never met these people. They had never worked for the organization before. And I knew that I had to bring these people under the umbrella and I had to align them with the goals and make them feel safe because some of these people who weren't uh, were in clerk roles, they're not medical. They don't, they're, they're taking a job in a medical facility in a pandemic when they've never dealt with any pathogen or viral illness before. So letting them know that I was going to keep their safety at the forefront. So when I first got to meet them, I, I made a couple promises. Mm. Uh, the first promise was that I would never ask anyone to do something that um, I wouldn't do myself. Uh, the next thing is that we were going to have a, a culture of safety that would not break for anything and that we would do everything in our ability to make sure that they went home healthy to their family every single day. And thirdly, which I thought was probably one of the most useful um, promises I made them is that I would do everything in my power to help them get to the next places in their lives that they wanted to be, whether that was with the organization or um, furthering their professional careers or into school and built a relationship with each one of them so that their alignment with, with my goals for the facility um, also supported their goals personally. I know you've got a background in soccer, playing soccer, soccer coaching. So did this leadership challenge resemble what you've experienced and what you've done as a sports coach? Absolutely. It was it, it was the same language, just being used in a different way. You're, you're coming to a new team. So when you're, when you're joining a new team, how you enter the room or that space for the very first time is, is, is important, whether you're a coach or a player. And one of the most useful um, kind of concepts that I had with that is that um, power, power dynamics are not um, a scarcity, right? If, if you have power, you can give power to, to others. And if you're un, uh, strong in your understanding of that, um, but people who are not necessarily familiar with leadership are not certain of their own power will view power as a, as a scarcity or a limited resource. So they think if they give it away that they're undermining their, their own ability to, to, to be strong. Um, that's not, it's really not the case. If, if you know your space and you know what you're good at, you know that there's going to be skills that you don't necessarily have that other, other individuals might be able to bring those to the table. That's really interesting. So when you, step into a coaching position or a leadership position within uh, within a health service you're considering the power dynamic you're aware of the of the power that you hold as a coach as a leader and you're essentially looking to give some of that away you're looking to flatten uh, that power threat uh, relationship you're looking to bring people into the fold and um, elevate their power. Yes. And like, so like soccer, if you, if you have, let's say a Sunday kickabout, right. And you know, sometimes Sunday kickabouts can be kind of competitive, but if you want, don't know your team, your best position is to start close together and compact. So you can easily talk to each other. So you are, are able to cover more easily for some, someone's maybe lack there of skill or positioning. Um, so, the first thing is to get get together and then and then as the group starts to communicate you start to develop these these um, very new communications that that are, are individual to each person in each team uh, you can start to engage in your forward progress right so then you bias towards action does that come under the rubric of a culture of safety that's a good question um, I think it, it comes under it comes under this the space that you don't know what you don't know until you kind of see the dynamics of the situation and until you until you have um, some cohesion as a group you it, it's hard to kind of just make progress because you don't know where you're going. 
right? And so when when you don't know where you're going and you're in this assessment phase of trying to figure out, okay, well, we have this massive group of people, whether it's 5, 10, 20, how do, how do I find a common thread between all of us and say, this is where we need to go? You need time to start to say, okay, well, do all these people speak the same language as me? So getting to know your team and the goal, well, maybe things are, are not necessarily going in the direction you, you, you want them to go quite immediately. Um, but until you understand where you need to get, you, the first most immediate step. So what is the first bias towards action that is going to bring us closer to our goal? Right. It's going to be something super, super small, super, super simple. And so, yeah, if you say like, OK, well, we're going to focus on safety. That's our very first thing we're doing. We all kind of know what that means. And we all start to kind of work towards that. And we start to explain that until we have our next our next most closest milestone that we can get to. Right. And then you have a third milestone and now you have a trajectory. Relationship. All- Sorry, carry on. Now, once you have this trajectory, you can start to set further milestones, but you still need breadcrumbs to keep people on, on, on the track because otherwise the group cohesion can kind of be challenged. You ended up delivering 3 million vaccines, something like that. So my, my site personally did about 170,000. Um, but we had several other operations managers come to our site to orientate, and the group collective uh, program did about three million. So others were influenced by how you were leading your group. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd like to think so. I mean, it's just it, circling back to just giving away your your power to other people so that they can be ef- effective. Um, we we had a a strong initial culture at that um, at that site because you know the people bought into the message and the vision, and we were getting traction very quickly, and we bonded as a team over those concepts and just reiterated them. So every morning when when the team came in, I would do a like a pregame chat with them, and we would talk about anything that happened the previous day and then a couple simple goals for that day that we could objectively say yes or no were achieved at the end of that day. And we would review at the end of the day. And in, in terms of ending the day, we also try to take a breath at the end of that day to release what happened that was beyond our control and, and, I describe that as reducing the noise. Be like, look, this happened. It wasn't great, but we have to pull that out of of our consciousness because we can't control that right now. We have to focus on what we can control and what we can impact, and that'll smooth out the road later on. And so we would have that uh, that closure for our days. And I really just talked about people like, you know, get rest. This is going to be a long haul. Um, and we were working extreme hours. It was a seven day week operation. um, And people would work a lot, like 10, 20 days in a row before having a break. Um, It was, uh, it was fairly intense process. And when you're in it for months, uh, sometimes it feels like it's never going to end. So you have to keep, take these moments where you get them. Let me reflect back to you. Some of the things I heard there. relationship is really important to you providing safety for people, lessening the threat felt felt as a consequence of power. Absolutely. You, you spoke about framing the day ahead, the specific challenges you were going to face, and then setting goals with the people that were that you were leading. Um, you would have a team talk at the beginning of the day. You talked about helping your people control the controllables. You talked about the importance of rest and recovery. 
just dwelling briefly on the relationship side of things, perhaps taking a step back there, was the social relationship or social cohesion when you reflect back on what you experienced during the pressure of COVID? Was the social relationship, was the social cohesion more important than the task cohesion? I, I would say so. Or, or vice versa? No, I would, I would say the social cohesion was more important. Um, the landscape shifted so frequently. Like on a day-to-day basis, we were receiving massively new information. And so when you're doing a 180 degree course change, the social cohesion is the only constant. The human relationship between you, your team and themselves together. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and we talked, we, we talked frequently about how we interacted with people, with each other. So I, I, w- I frequently would review that communication is two-way. Even if I send it, I don't necessarily know how it's received. And so I have to check in with that person. It's the same thing as when we both go watch a movie. You might love it. I might not love it. But until we filter out the noise and, and have a shared experience, we don't know how that landed with us. And so we constantly checking in with each other and organizing small side um, discussions for people who had had a friction point. So we, we t- constantly attended to those relationships. When you say constantly checking in, what does that mean in real terms? I would have, if I'd been working, if I'd been working with you for mm-hmm. you, what would I have experienced from you as a leader in that respect? I tried to be very visible. I would. Even whenever I had like a break in between meetings, about 15 minutes or so, I would tour the floor and just say hello to everybody, ask them how they're doing and th- made sure that they knew if there was a, a threatening issue that they could stop me in my tracks and explain it to me right there and then and it would be dealt with immediately. I, be- I believe leadership is, is, is a service and I need to do or a leader needs to do what those they wish to lead need so that they will do what the leader wants right because well what I want them to do is a want what they need me to do so they will do that that's a need and so I would be in between meetings, I'd bomb out there, wave to everybody, say hi, just be super visible. And at the end of the the day, I would let them know that I would be in the office um, before we were going to start the next day. And if anyone needed my time, that they could could book me um, and I would give them dedicated 100% attention. And they did. Almost every day I'd have somebody that had something going on because I mean, it's a, it's a pandemic, right? Like these people were lacking for childcare. Um, some of them had been laid off and had no jobs and, and their pay was um, a challenge, right? We were on bo- boarded several thousand people <laughs> like in, in a very short order. And so there was a lot of uh, stressors outside the workplace that were affecting these people very deeply. And it was almost like we were progressing through a, a, a minor mass trauma together with all the stress of the patients that we were dealing with. Um, so just really being sensitive to that, I think, was helpful. So you made yourself visible. Mm-hmm. You increased the feeling of safety by helping your people understand that you'd meet the needs that they had and then you'd make office hours available if they wanted to utilize that if they had something to say to you or ask you you had that open door policy yep. and you think the combination of those and possibly other subtle and more nuanced factors 
increase that social relationship, that social cohesion, which was in many respects more important than the task cohesion or building a shared mental model because there wasn't really room for that because the challenges were shifting every day. The landscape was flexing every day. And so really it was only that social cohesion that would be your constant. Absolutely. When we first started talking at the end of last year, you sent to me four principles that held up your leadership process. Again, respecting that there's always going to be other factors, components, approaches, etc. But you felt that there was four principles that underpinned what you did as a leader. And we've mentioned a few already, but we can unpack it a little bit more. Um, and actually, within these four principles, you could possibly say relationship is built into this. But we've already mentioned a frame, frame and a goal, a frame and a goal. So framing the day's challenge and setting goals. Can you, because I think this is really pertinent in sport, in terms of who frames the challenges, who sets the goals, more and more, I think coaches are becoming more autonomy supportive, co-creating the goals and co-creating the challenges based on listening to what players have to say um, about what they think the challenges are. Is it the same for you? Or were you very much the authoritative figure at the top driving this frame and goal talk to us about that unpack it a bit i think co-creator is actually a very apt description um, i got the marching orders essentially from my leadership but when you're in a situation with so many variables you have to have co-creators and what I learned is that I could be strong on the vision and where the goal line was, but the how that occurred happens with the with the team that you have, right? And, and so being a co-creator, you have to let go of what, what you can't control because certain individuals just can't perform certain certain ways. And just al allowing them to be and encouraging them to bring their best self. Uh, I think that was that was the key. Was there a rousing speech from you at the beginning of each day? There were a couple of good ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so there was some influence from you from a top down perspective. There were your voice was there. Your voice was being heard. But goals were co-created. If I was there at the beginning of the day, I'd be there. I'd listen to you set the goals or I would work with my colleagues on the goals. Then we'd be released onto the floor or what? I would I would tell them the goal okay. and ask them how we're going to do it. Yeah. Right? I said, here is what we need to accomplish. How are we going to get this done? And... I said, if anyone wants to be a part of those decisions, here's my office. I will give you the framework that we need for you to be able to contribute in any way that you want to contribute to that. I will show you and teach you how to do that. And I had anything from staff who had been around in medical 20 years that had never been talked to about how to do a quality improvement process to people who had only ever run a clothing store coming in and wanting to learn about a quality improvement process. That's really interesting. So part of your team, you had people who weren't or hadn't had industry experience. They didn't have the main specific knowledge. No. Did you find those people brought in expertise outside of the health sector that was useful for what you were doing? Absolutely. And, and that's why I think co-creating is such a good description of it is we were, mm. we were facing a challenge and trying to do something that has never been done before. I mean, our, 
our medical system, at least over here, is never been mobilized in an almost militaristic way. Uh, and I don't mean militaristic in like any type of like authoritarian component, but I mean a mass mobilization of we are mm -hmm. all doing this today. <laughs> and and so the stretches of an organization um, are ends up moving moving it in a way it's never moved before. And again, just like sports, if you're asking an athlete to do something that their body has never done before, uh, the tendons and ligaments don't always respond initially the way you want them to. And, and so taking a couple small steps and then bigger ones anytime you had to change direction. You used a sporting analogy there. This principle framing and goal setting, creating a frame and setting goals. I think it's it's interesting because as you were speaking there, I was thinking of the, the parallels with sport and the head coach, the manager, the leader standing at the front of the players at the, the beginning of the day, potentially with some kind of rousing story, anecdote, speech. Nothing wrong with that because I think a leader's voice is valuable. That's what leadership is all about even as we progress to become more autonomy supportive within our leadership processes, practices. But what I love about what you're talking about is that you've framed the challenge for the day. This is where not authoritarian, but authoritative. You've led from the front by framing the challenge, laid down the goals, but then being more autonomy supportive within your authoritative approach to leadership you've i'm assuming uh, got your team talking together to um create that the how you've given them the what this is what we want and i think sport i, I hate using the word tradition traditional but i'll use it in this instance traditional approaches to coaches have been well this is the what and the how this is what we want and this is how we're going to do it. And again, then that, that it's context specific. That might be an optimal way in a specific situation. But often getting the players involved, helping them become participants rather than just recipients, helping them then, then be involved with the how. That's what, if I was involved under your leadership, that's what I'm hearing that you'd have me doing um, and you'd benefit from that involvement it's the co-creation yeah and what we when we talk framework that process was the same every day okay and what one day when we had one of our leaders i was actually i tried to take it tried to take a day off and i get get a call uh, from the from the site they said the supervisor never showed up and i was like what and they're like no one's here the staff just took over and they applied the process. Mm -hmm. They did the pregame chat. They, they, they did everything because the, the frame and the scaffolding was already there for them and they ran flawlessly. So when one leader goes down or is not available, everybody else knows the rules and they apply them and they were able to carry on just as if, Nothing had happened. It was beautiful. That's your ultimate as a head coach, isn't it? If if you're ill, if you can't turn up for the day, can the, your people, your players, drive training or drive game day? That's That's got to be the ultimate. That's when you know you've got participants and not just recipients. Well, if we're looking at co-creator, that could be anyone that goes down. That could be your... your your center center midfielder that could be any team member member goes down if the framework is strong enough then we know what gap has mm -hmm. to be filled and it doesn't have to be filled by one person it can be filled by two that just kind of move slightly closer together and and cover that space yeah i've got a lot going through my head in, at the moment because i just think I, I, i'm quite taken i'm quite taken with that idea that you know e even just for me as a 
a sports psychology consultant actually challenging a head coach. Mm -hmm. If you were absent for the day, would your people, mm -hmm. not just your, not, not, not your assistant coach, not, not your assistant manager, mm -hmm. but would your people at ground level, your players essentially be able to take over here? Um, I think it's, it would be, it would be an interesting, uh, an interesting test, that's for sure. Hey, look, your second principle that you sent me was yeah. reducing noise. What do you mean by that, reducing noise? So it's it's great segue from that last point because because that that's that's noise is when someone drops out of the operation by no fault of their own, right? That something mm -hmm. happens. How do you? remove what can't be changed from from your goals to move forward noise is anything you can't control that is an interference in what you're trying to do and and so sometimes you have to accept certain realities to get back to your goal orientation and i found a lot of the time that if we got past initial noise and put it that issue behind us, we would almost be able to make it through to the next thing, so to say. Yeah, as you're speaking now, I'm thinking about a lot of the communication I have with clients around being self-referenced and task-oriented. I suppose control the controllables, focus on you, focus on you and our team, focus on the tasks that we can control. That's so, so relevant every day in sports. And it sounds like it was so, so relevant with your COVID project. Yeah, I, I feel like the ideology of this for me is I, I feel that culturally sport predates modern healthcare. And, and so if you look at those prime principles of what is sport it's a group of people trying to accomplish a goal and and that culture is so deeply ingrained in us i think it's just there's a lot there these rich concepts that are so effective in doing anything and i like to when i'm coaching soccer or in, involved in sports i'd like to pull from my healthcare background to give them in in a soccer game an, an example of of intent or purpose as well um, and a, a phrase I, I like to use is I'll, I'll hold out my hand and we're trying to work on a principle in either a game or a practice and I'll ask them how many times do you think a surgeon has practiced making that cut on someone's flesh what is their mindset to do that a procedure that has high consequence and could be anyone how do you how do you approach a sports driven skill as if you have a hand on a scalpel and i'll hold up my hand and i'll say you don't want to be shaking you want to practice that as real and as intently as as possible so you get the desired outcome. And so to be able to do that, you need to reduce the noise around you, the stresses around you, the sources of anxiety around you. You need to focus on what you can control. You need to be self-referenced. You need to be task-oriented. You need to be mastering your trade um, rather than being thrown by performance factors that you can't control. Absolutely. Was there any time during those months that you were leading this team that you were administering thousands of jabs as havoc was engulfing the world in many respects that you that perhaps the team came away from that task orientation where there are moments where perhaps there things felt a bit out of control and there were some real challenges every day <laughs> right. every, every day 
um, something would come out on the news and you'd have the public deeply concerned about this or that. Um, sometimes, you know, vaccine supply all over the world was up and down. Mm. Um, who you were giving admini- administering doses to um, would change on, on an hourly basis. And so how mm-hmm. do you tell someone a few hours earlier was getting, was in the included group is no, is now in the excluded group and our staff members are people, right? Like this is a deeply human crisis they're, they're going, going through and perceived as, as a, a, you know, a life-saving kind of measure. And don't get me wrong. I think the, the vaccines are some of the most, powerful medicines ever created um but it was it was it was an incredible challenge to get through um and i think that i think we put forward a world-class effort and world-class results how did you manage yourself through that when we think of sports psychology techniques you know we talk often about self-talk we talk often about imagery we talk often about flexing attention we talk often about uh, increasing our intensity reducing our arousal levels Um, what kind of things do you do as a leader as as these mini disasters around the world were unfolding but you had the you had the responsibility to help shape uh, the response in a specific part of the world how are you managing yourself just as coaches have to um, it's not the same as COVID and I'm not saying that for one second but just how as coaches have to manage themselves through tough moments games points of the season what were you doing for yourself I I tried to lead by example and I wanted accountability of any action that I performed, whether it went well or where, when it didn't go well, I wanted to be accountable for those. And I wanted to openly demonstrate to, to the team how to approach what doesn't go well. It's easy to be on the team when you're winning, but when something doesn't, go the way you want it to how do you how do you get up from that and approach it in a professional capacity so 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 unpacking that that if i was to look at that at granular detail i would reflect back to you that that sounds like strong goal directed self-talk um i have to be accountable here no matter how stressful it is i have to lead by example uh, I'm leading from a behavioural perspective. Um, but I would imagine there must be times when it got, or perhaps there wasn't, but there were times when it got so tough that you would have to take some breaths, that you'd have to take yourself outside, that you'd have to give, uh, talk not just for the sake of, I ha- you know, I have to be brave, I have to be a warrior here, but, you know, where really there were what I would, I suppose, I use the term ants, automatic negative thoughts where there was an infestation of ants where there was an ant farm growing in your head where days were really really tough or maybe not trevor i mean i, I but i just i think it's i think it's interesting i uh, there, there was there was several moments where i was near 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 breaking points um and we use this warrior term and i i don't necessarily think it's a great description of actually of what we're looking for because warriors get broken and we can't break and so balancing your rigidity and strength with your flexibility and understanding does that make sense yeah uh, I suppose in my mind, I'm translating that as I'm giving myself and others permission to be vulnerable, yep. to experience vulnerability. In front of your team. 
and the coping mechanisms to flex through moments of vulnerability, through challenge, and carry on as best one can. As best one can. Your third principle, review and retarget. Review and retarget. I love these chunks. Frame and goal, reducing noise, review and retarget. What do you mean by review and retarget? So when something goes well, you don't want, you you tend to pick up inertia. But when something doesn't go well, it, things get clunky, right? Now, if you pick up too much inertia, people tend to get ahead of themselves and the trajectory of your goal might be now overshot. Same thing is when you have a when you have a, a lead in a game, hmm. you start playing, you change change your style, start playing too loose, kind of having more free flowing fun, and all of a sudden two, two zero becomes two one becomes two two becomes three two. Or when you're clunking and you're tripping over your own feet, nothing's going right, and and negative effects are compounding. Yeah, not about that. So, how do you? review to look at where am I right now? What is my next nearest talk target? What is the next influential decision I can make now to get closer to the goal? And you want to hand the team a small, quick win. All right, we got that. Let's build on that. Now we got this big win or a slightly larger goal, got that down, got that down. You get two or three successes in a row, and now you have positive momentum again. But those super small kind of controllable items, they're so powerful for when your team is in need, needs it. it. Makes me think of present moment thinking or present moment focus, which is obviously has been a popular philosophical underpinning for competition with sports psychology for many years, stay in the present moment. And then the power of small wins, as you're saying, those you know, tiny wins, small wins, um, giving you those injections of confidence. But small wins are delivered through small tasks, and if again that comes back to that task orientation, which again is, is linked to present moment thinking. So it sounds like review and retarget is very much trying to help your team manage the emotional side of things. Almost they never get never be too up, never get too down. Stay present minded. Yeah, uh, and I would I would uh, I would liken it to steering a large marine vessel. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and because you don't want to oversteer. Yeah. You, your amount of your your speed and how many course corrections you're doing um, are important. And each each time you're doing a course correct correction costs political capital with your people. What do you mean by that political capital? Well, you 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 accumulate political capital by working with your team in a way that, you know, that it feels good, those nice moments um, when, when you're providing them with something that they need or want. But when you're making an ask, listen, Dan, I'm not happy the way or I, I need you to change what you're doing, Dan, um, X, Y, Z, as political, political capital, right? That I'm, that I'm spending with you to be like, in a situation where you don't really want to do what I'm asking you to do, but I'm asking you to do it. If you start to have these little kind of micro rebellions happen in small groups, you, you risk the, the contagion of that rebellion spreading to the larger group. So managing your political capital that people who are not on board with the total goal are are the outsiders and not able to recruit people to the divergent way of thinking. Mm. Makes me think of task cohesion, 
engagement, player engagement, people engagement. Yeah. Player engagement. Yeah. Cool. So everybody, every single player has to, has to believe that their role and task are important and they are important by virtue of that. Yeah. Interesting. Because it, it, I always say to audiences, you know, I see coaching in terms of three P's, participation, progression, and performance. And we get very carried away with the performance piece, obviously, because uh, we love that competitive side. The progression piece is really important with the learning side, but both of those really yep. are nothing without the participation piece, which is about the engagement piece, engaging players, engaging people, helping them pay attention, uh, helping them feel important. Yep. And, and realizing a mundane task can be critical. And so one of the tasks that we had that was relatively mundane was actually moving clipboards <laughs> for when paperwork's getting filled out, we needed those paper because otherwise the, these people had nowhere to fill out the, the documents we ne- needed from them to progress through the through the operation and so some people were at when i first pointed it out um that i could see some people didn't want this one role Mm. i said i asked them i'm like here's a piece of paper try filling it out and i did this at the the talk and they're writing on their hand and the pen's going through the paper and i say this machine breaks down with the most mundane task we have Think about that. This went si- the whole team went silent. There was probably 60 people there. <laughs> right? And the visualization of seeing that paper failure by this mundane task brought us would bring us all down. And the that day, the, I don't think we ever had a shortage of uh, of, of uh, clipboards. People were hustling those things in, back into position. Your final principle, recover and repeat. So we've got frame and goal. We've got reducing noise, review and retarget, and now recover and repeat. I can take some good guesses as to what this would be about, but um, please give us, just unpack this for us in some detail. So when I, when I got into this project, I, I, I knew going in, it was going to be a marathon, not just one marathon. It was going to be marathon after marathon. And the cognitive load in my decision-making was so strenuous that I had to use every single tool I've acquired across my, my career. I had a book where I wrote down every single promise that I was making to anyone. So I could say, okay, well, Dan, I said, I would do this to you on this day. Here's what I've done on that. Um, That I was focusing on my sleep, that I would take a one hour walk um, or whenever I could, like sometimes you would have a one hour walk. uh, It was in the evening, it was in the morning before work, whenever, just by myself, no electronics, Um, but really, showing the team how I treated myself in terms of recovery. And I, I try to treat myself like I was performing an athletic event, getting good mm-hmm. sleep, letting things go when they, when they were kind of uh, bothering me. Um, but if, if as a leader, you don't treat yourself kindly, no one is going to believe that you're going to treat them kindly. And you can't you can't spoil yourself either because they all look at how, at how you treat yourself. So if you're a hypocrite and you say one thing but do another, you lose your credibility. But if you're also a taskmaster, an unrelenting taskmaster that is that is working yourself to absolute death every, in every moment, the staff or your team are going to think, well, they're going to work me to death. <laughs> you, you have to work and be in a way 
where there is an adequate recovery. So the staff at the end of their day go, I can show up again tomorrow at my best self. And I want to show up again tomorrow at my best self. And that, and understanding there's ebbs and flows operationally where you're going to have downtime sometimes. Catch your breath in those moments and, and enjoy that moment. But don't let the professionalism drop. It always has to stay clean and together. I'm just going to ask, I mean, you've got thousands and thousands of people coming through. Dozens of people administering injections, jabs. Um, I'm assuming really that the recovery was, it was shift yep. work and, but you made it your job to make sure that your people were engaged in a period yep. of recovery, that they would have tools to enable them to get the most from the time that they were away from their desk. Yeah, and one of the early learnings was because every all my staff were wearing masks and we're doing 10-hour shifts and this building occasionally before we got the AC going, we'd get occasionally warm. Uh, I, I learned that hydration would become an issue because they weren't drinking water and they're, they're actively functioning. Like it wasn't uncommon for my staff to have 25,000 steps in a day, some of them. And so when they're not, you're not drinking water for mm. 10 hours, nine hours in a row. Um, Cause you know, there were days where we didn't really get breaks because something happened. There were days where another issue would come up and we would be working long, much longer than our 10 hour schedule, 10 hour shift. And so paying attention acutely to, to the recovery um, was very important. Making sure that people were getting their breaks was probably one of, one of the most critical factors and, and focusing them on doing a marathon tomorrow as well and the next day and the next day and the next day because there were a couple people that would come in and they would just go bonkers and then they'd injure themselves <laughs> and something like that and we were so every team member was so important you didn't have that luxury right you're you're, you're dealing with sharp items and you're poking them into a the mass public who can respond any number of ways um, to being poked with an item <laughs> that is in, injecting a medication in, into their arm. And for the most part, it went really well, but every now and then something would happen. And if they weren't in a ready state, then worse things happened. Right? And nothing like our safety profile for our patient care was spectacular, but you know, a couple people like a staff, you know, they had some twitch right as the needles going in and you had a staff poke themselves and stuff like that. It was the people that were not recovered. Right. And it's too high of a cost. Fatigue influences competence. Um, I more look at it as ready state. You mm. you want your people to be ready to perform at their highest caliber when you need them, and that's not possible when they're in a fatigue state. Right? Sometimes you have to work through being tired and things like that. Um, but being able to have action potential, they feel better about that when they're able to rise to the occasion and, and hit their goals in that moment. Like it, it worked better than I don't want you to wear yourself out. I want to reflect back to you now to close this 
fascinating conversation. I want to reflect back to you now. Some of the things I've heard, um, I've heard that during the pandemic, you were leading this health unit that administered over 170,000 jabs and influenced other units around you. So you were an influential leader under this intense pressure, um, something none of us had ever seen before, hopefully you will never see again. You had to bring people in from all walks of life, not just people who had or worked solely in the health sector. And I know that, I mean, you got in contact with me because you, in, in essence, said, my leadership is very much based on sports psychology principles. My background is soccer co- soccer player, soccer coach, sports psychology principles. And, and, and the four principles that you shaped were frame and goal, reducing noise, review ret- and retarget, recover and repeat. Reflecting back to you, what I heard was that from day dot, you were you were invested in creating a culture of safety. You were always considering power dynamics. You were constantly checking in, staying visible, keeping your office door open. Um, from that safety aspect, you were you were always considering the needs of your people. Um, you helped your people be self-referenced and task-oriented, focus on what they can control, present moment thinking, watching for inertia or clunky moments of work. If it was going too well, if it wasn't going so well at all, looking for small wins, uh, rest, recovery, optimal recovery, absolutely vital as the day, as the days when uh, slipped by and the days wore off. So there's a whole load of leadership and management processes in there. If you can, if you, when you reflect back, two questions. Number one, what was the most impactful thing that you did, do you think, that you think you could never take away? And number two, if you could get in the time machine and go back, would there be anything that you would do differently? In a nutshell. <laughs> Those are deep questions. Um, being conscious how I showed up, I think was critical and showing up the way I wanted other people to show up, right? Kind, ready to go, realizing that we were in a massive life-saving effort. And having worked on the front lines and put breathing tubes in people that were affected by this disease, I've seen the full spectrum of the damage it could do to people. And knowing full well that we weren't seeing that same damage occur to people who had had the vaccine, how important it was, meant that I had to show up. I don't know if there's anything I could have done differently. I think there were a lot of constraints. And I realized that any thing I would have done differently would have had corresponding knock-on effects that would have changed the outcome of something so big and so complicated. I don't think it would have had a predictive value the constraints of being able to get staffing for filling positions and the hours in the day and the problems we face. While there's lots I would have liked to have done differently, I'm not sure I had the capacity to be any different at the time. And in closing, um, I got into Twitter about 2016 and somewhere after there that I was leading a small community hospital at that time and I that's where I stumbled upon upon your work um, but in in this process I, I read your tweets a lot and they were just so easy to implement 
um, I did feel like that work was was a part of my work. So I, I do want to thank you for putting that stuff out there. And I do tell people about your your uh, your your podcast and your book and, and your stuff because it, it works, Dan. It's just so simple and effective to just have these concepts. The nuance of leadership and psychology is so influential in our in, in our performances. I would almost say that it surprises me now that we don't dedicate more time to psychological performance in any aspect of of people growing up, young people growing up, whether it's sports or business or anything. Um, because we spend a lot of time trying to physically develop them, run faster, lift weights, whatever it might be, training. But working on that mental muscle to be able to perform and be what you want to be in those moments that matter. So you can define the moment instead of letting a moment define you. Well said. And uh, it's always nice to hear somebody um, taking the, the time to read my rambles and uh, find them find them uh, reasonably useful. So, you know, and there's so much great stuff out there on Twitter from so many sports sites. So there, there is um, so many golden nuggets to be to be picked up from that platform. So, and and Trevor, I thank you so much for for today and and and, and talking through what you did to to lead such a great team and to well such an incredible contribution to um, such a challenging time. So uh, thank you so much for today. Thanks, Dan. It was a pleasure to be on. It was a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. That was Trevor White. I really enjoyed that podcast. It was a little bit different today, um, getting to, to learn about uh, sports psychology utilised within the leadership practice in the healthcare sector. I hope you did enjoy that. Um, if you do have any suggestions about any future episodes, please do get in contact via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the Sports Site Show. And, and of course, if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.